my film is called The Challenge of Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you understand by the challenge that Steiner's left us? Well, to begin with, his work is so immense. He was such a gift in so many ways that I think we feel sort of ordinary standing next to the wealth of consciousness and insight that he had. So it seems to me that all of us as human beings who followed after, there's some piece of it we want to chew and take it up and digest it more fully uh, because none of us could be that grand in our scope. So that, that to me is yes. a challenge, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the challenges I feel is that in our world we have this split between the very practical, scientific, linear way of thinking that has produced what we call progress and that we need day to day. And then we have the spiritual side, um, the people who have re responded by reacting to this, by being more psychic and more spiritual, who tend to be unpractical and don't like to think so much. And Steiner brings both together. And that's the challenge. It's the challenge of our time, but he's an example of somebody who did that. It's very difficult, but it's what we need to do, is to bring the clarity of thinking to the spiritual and not limit it the way thinking is limited in our scientific world. Mm -hmm. um, how is that reflected in what you're doing here, then? Well, see, the challenge is that Scientific medicine, conventional medicine, doesn't recognize something beyond the physical body. So everything has to be biochemical or structural or mechanical. And so the flower essences, in their point of view, is just hocus pocus. There isn't anything there. I mean, homeopathy would fit in the same category. And then you have the people who are trying to understand these messages from the spiritual world that express themselves through the flowers, but they do it through channeling or through some kind of psychic impressions that aren't well researched, they aren't brought through with clarity. And so those are the two polarities that we are trying to bring together into the spiritual science point of view that Steiner was the example of. What do you understand by this word spiritual? And, and we under, you know, the plants exist physically, clearly. We see mm -hmm. them and we appreciate them. But what, what do you understand by uh, this word spiritual? Then? Well, I think that it's that we live in, we live in and receive from a world beyond this material world. And we as human beings are more than just this physical body. We need medicines that also reach into the other energy networks, matrices, whatever you want to call them. There's so much that compromises or, or that, that encompasses what the human being is. And I think that's part of what our work is. Yeah. As are many other people asking these questions, what is healing? How do we know that we're healed? Um, is it just that we take, you know, a remedy for our cold? Or is it that, for instance, we get a lot of colds and it's because we're under a lot of stress and the stress eats in to our physical well-being. So, for instance, flower essences would be something that would help us to understand there's a stress component and to begin to identify what is that? How do we particularly carry stress and are unable to release it? So that is kind of one of the ways we're working, you can't categorize stress. It's not a material phenomena. We see the material results, but it's really something that involves the soul. And that's what Dr. Bach felt about these remedies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was so inspired at the beginning by Dr. Bach's little essay called Heal Thyself. And there he says that to be healthy, we have to make a connection with our spiritual purpose. Why am I here? What am I here to learn? What, how am I here to serve? And then it's our personality, which is the expression of our soul, that mediates between that spiritual inspiration and archetype and how we live in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the flower essences are working in that realm. It's not just pure spirit in a very abstract way, but how is the spirit embodied in my life? Mm -hmm. And if we're doing something we feel no connection with inwardly, we're not healthy. And the physical body will express that. Mm 
-hmm. So that was Dr. Bach's key insight that excited mm -hmm. me, is what I'm, health is not just being normal to fit into the world we're in. Health is finding out why I'm here, who I am, and how can I express that in the world. Yeah. And, and where does, I mean, Steiner had similar mm -hmm. insights, didn't he, then, yeah. to, to, to Dr. Bach? Yeah. Right. Well, I would say that one of the things we need to remember about Steiner is that he really brought his work on the foundations of Rosicrucianism. And there's a really core meditation on Rosicrucianism. It's one that he has in his seminal work, Occult Science. And it's this meditation that you consider that a plant has purity, but the human being has freedom. And it's really then, that's the core Rosicrucian meditation, that you, you meditate on this incredible purity, this blood, you would say the sap of the plant, and then the blood of the human being, which we have personal desires because we're individuated, we have our own consciousness, but we have freedom. And so for the Rosicrucians, that really was a core understanding that the plants were there to help us do something, which is to purify what we want to call the soul body or the astral body, this, this body of feelings, thoughts, impulses, wishes. And just as the plant on a physiological level has the carbon, I mean, we, it takes up the carbon from the human being, and then, therefore, we have oxygen. In other words, the plant is a purifier, literally, of our physical world. Every scientist would agree with that, that the plant gives us something by which we literally live. But what is not understood, and what the Rosicrucians wanted us to understand, is that those same plants also have an ability to purify another strata of the human being, which we would call the soul body. And, and Paracelsus was a great influence on Dr. Bach. Paracelsus was really coming from that Rosicrucian stream. So I think that what Rudolf Steiner wanted us to do to, is to also awaken to the stream of Rosicrucianism. He stood really on the foundations of that work in bringing forward anthroposophy. And I would say that the work we're doing with plants is very much a part of this idea that the plant has something to speak to the human being. Even though the plant may seem rather, you know, weak and insignificant, it actually is a very potent substance, um, not only physiologically, but I would say psychologically. And this is what we have found, is that learning the archetypes of these plants and then making them into the appropriate medicines is really a way for human beings to awaken a kind of consciousness that is self-reflective and, and helps us to become aware. Would you say, Richard, is different than, than psychology as well? I mean... Yeah, well, psychology is which I studied before I met the flower essences, wonderful system of understanding the ways in which human beings get stuck in their emotions and thoughts. The flower essences, as I expressed it, nourish that part of our soul that is the transformed part. So mm -hmm. it's actually a kind of soul nourishment. And it helps people as a kind of catalyst to make changes. And so a lot of people use that flower essence as an aspect of a holistic health practice, as a counseling practice of self-development, because they mirror from the plant world a part of ourselves that we've lost touch with, and then we can get in touch with that. And it's not like they're manipulating us the way that a, a drug or yeah. pharmaceutical would. Very different than that. They're reminding us of who we are. And clearly, we're not talking about plants in general, but, but individual plants that yeah. do with individual problems, if you like. Is yeah. that right? I mean, you, it's you've the got, specificity I mean, of the many, work. How many, yeah. uh, how many essences have you right. got here? And, I mean, and uh, that is... Several hundred. Several, several hundred. hundred. And yes. that, is the, that is really this kind of work, as much as it seems like it might have been in another age, a mis more mystical age or a more unitive consciousness age, this work could really only have come now because the, the 
incredible ability to see all of these aspects of the human psyche really only comes to birth in what Steiner called the consciousness soul, which interestingly was that same time in the 1400s, 1500s, when the Rosicrucian work dawned on the planet and alchemical work in general, which is that we have this incredible ability now to have very distinct states of consciousness. You know, um, I mean, there isn't just one word for fear. There's all kinds of fear. There isn't just one word for anxiety or for greed. So what we see is that the human soul has become ever more complex. But what medicine offers for that part of the human being are, are pharmaceutical drugs that basically shut down those feelings, shut down those, those you know, uh, emotions of anxiety or fear. What we actually need to do is learn how to see them. That's what the consciousness soul or the, that part of the soul that is awake and articulate has to learn to name it, see it, and transform it. And that's really an alchemical path. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what really is the hallmark of our work. Yeah. So even if, as it were, one um, imbibes these essences, that's not a sort of magic cure in itself. We have no. work to do as well. Yeah, no, because otherwise this would be a drug. Yeah. It's not a drug. It is a way of awakening and reflecting. You know, there's really, we really have researched four basic stages that happen. You know, where you might initially feel a relaxation response, but then you begin to have a kind of witness consciousness that sort of sees behavior. Just to give you a quick example, I was working with a, a, a mom, high stress situation, coming home yelling at her kids, which very understandable when you're under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress, yelling at her kids. What she couldn't understand and see in that situation was that her children really needed her to sort of just calm down for a moment and be with them. So she, she interpreted her children as sort of coming at her with this energy. She started taking a particular remedy that we have for, for anger. It's called scarlet monkey flower. It's a red flower. And, it, you know, she began to see for herself. That's what's interesting with these plants. She began to see, wait a moment. I'm meeting this situation with anger. And, the, and she watched herself start to get angry and watched her children respond to the anger. And then we also will often use counseling so that it isn't only that you take the remedy all alone. You might come back and sort of digest that piece with a counselor or you might keep a journal. But you begin to see a part of yourself that was heretofore unconscious a way your soul operated in the world. And you, you begin to acquire some ability to step back and look at that. Once you can see it, you can begin to change it. And that's the beauty of the flower essences. Yeah. So they do, ultimately, she realized she had a lot of anger and she learned how to handle that anger, which is basically stress and tension. And I could give you so many stories, but that's the way flower essences work. It's not a magic potion in itself. No. So you could take a, 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 a pharmaceutical drug that would damp that down, but you also, your soul, would be that much less alive at the same time. But this is a, a way of healing where the soul becomes richer, more articulate, more aware of the various parts of itself. So that's really its hallmark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Bach. One of Bach's basic premises is that any kind of dis-ease, and we're talking not only physical, but as dis-ease, is a message to us. It's something that we need to learn. Either something that we've gone out of balance, or it's an opportunity to develop some aspect of ourselves. So if we just suppress it, like if we take an antidepressant for depression, then we're not getting that lesson. And that has to come up in some other form. But if we can welcome, like Rumi's poem, welcome all the guests into our house of all the different emotions, and then they have something to teach us, and we become fuller that way. Did, did Steiner take what Bach um, spoke about further? Uh, no. See, Bach really came, uh, he was a contemporary of Steiner's, but they never met. Yeah. 
So that's where we're not, we don't have a pedigree in the, in the Bach work. It doesn't come back to Steiner per se, although there are an awful lot of anthroposophists who use and recognize this way of healing. But um, Dr. Bach was active, really his work began as a medical doctor, and in World War I, he was right on the front lines receiving soldiers who had come back, and he recognized what is called shell shock, which didn't even really have a name yet until World War I. And he was also very involved in immunology. And so he developed a, a, a nosode, various sorts of nosodes that worked on, interestingly, he first classified according to the gut flora. So we always say he went from flora to flora. But he recognized, he began to see that there were certain types of people who needed certain types of remedies. This led him to homeopathy. He then was quite a prestig prestigious homeopath. He had an office on Harley Street, which is the place to be. He was well recognized and published, both in medical journals and then later in homeopathic journals of his day. But he still felt uneasy. He felt that there was yet another way of healing that went right into the soul. And that was his his ability then to recognize that if one made a plant substance right in the elemental matrix of the plant, in the where the plant, the bowls are put right on the earth where the plant grows, in the air, in the sunlight, um, so that one is making the remedy really as a part of uh, the living, as a part of the real matrix of that plant, that becomes a medicine it's potentized, it's, it's then it has another dilution level, but it becomes a medicine that can work into the soul in a very particular way. Not overwhelming the soul like a drug and yet having something archetypal that can stir the consciousness. And of course then we have to also train people. We train practitioners how to use these to get these kind of results. Historically, we don't know of a connection between Steiner and Bach. But in our work, it's been a crucial connection because there was a mystery left by Bach. He was somebody who was very intuitive, very sensitive, but he didn't leave a methodology. He left his results. And so this, the conventional wisdom was just to take those results and replicate them exactly as he did it. But the question that I asked was, if one person was able to do this, there must be a human capacity for reading the language of nature. Mm -hmm. And there were some hints in his work, in Bach's work of Paracelsus, but it wasn't until I met the work of Steiner and Gertian science that I was able to say, there is a methodology for understanding the language of nature and how it speaks to the human soul. And so following that methodology of plant observation, of a kind of meditative work inwardly, taking the image of the plant from sense perception as an inner experience, moving that as a metamorphosis of the plant into the flower, experiencing that inwardly. This became a methodology that enabled us to go beyond the work of Bach, not only in developing new remedies, but actually understanding something of this language of nature. So we, for, for example, developed a series of understandings of the plant families as having each of them a kind of archetypal theme that is expressed in the variations of the different essences. And it becomes something very similar to what Wilhelm Pelikan did with the anthroposophic remedies in his book, Healing Plants. But also I would say that the, uh, there's another component, which is, is that the, the phenomenology of what the human soul is is really directly from Steiner. Um, Bach wrote very little about that. You can see that he's a product of what we want to call the consciousness soul, this, this kind of awake, individuated soul that we have in our time. But it's really Steiner that laid out the whole panorama of what challenges the soul in our time and why freedom is such an important gift as well as conundrum in our time, that we need this individuality, and yet this individuality makes us selfish. It makes us isolated from others. It is the, the 
the bane of existence as well. And all of that really, I mean, the whole rich tapestry of Steiner's teachings on the human soul are absolutely also at the foundation of how we teach about this healing and what context we put it in. So it, I think it's both the plants and the understanding of the human soul that we owe to Steiner. Right, and the weaving so. of those two together is the essence of our work. And both of us took the Waldorf training, and although we don't teach children, it's a wonderful methodology for teaching in a soulful way. <laughs> you know, Rudolf Steiner, one of his core teachings in biodynamics is that the farm is an organism. It's its own individuality. And for it, for it to become an individuality, it really needs to reflect a wide swath of nature. The animals, the plants, the rocks, the, the terrain of the place, and human beings. We have people who come here daily to work. Um, and all of that is, as it were, it comes together in a kind of synthesis that creates something more than the plant. It's the home, the ambience for the plant to flourish. Yeah. Could you think of this as a farm? I think of it as a sanctuary, <laughs> as, as a wonderful healing sanctuary. It is a practical farm and a practical cottage for the industry of what we do, but it's also sacred. It also is beloved. Yes. So, and I, but I mean that in the most practical way, not in a, you know, it's right in the earth. Yeah. So, so we collect plants both from the wild and from the land here. So when we're creating um, a farm or uh, a matrix for this plants that grow here, we have to bring the balance of all the elements that occur naturally in the wild. So when we collect from the wild, the plant already is in total harmony with all the elements, the wild animals, the elements of the rock, the weather, everything is right there. And this is where it's been growing for perhaps millennia. But here we're creating human made. And so we're consciously mm -hmm. bringing together in the kind of alchemy of uh, the fertility through the compost and through the animals and all the different elements of nature brought together. And we also want this to be a place we teach here. And so we want this to be a place where people can sit somewhere and just have a thought, can wander at a lunch hour. We also have festivals. We've done memorials for neighbors that have died. We want this place to be very richly endowed with human essence as well as plant essence and animal essence and sky and earth it, it we want it all yeah so you more know? more than just the production facility i mean this is an educational center a teaching center uh, it's a place where people can reconnect to the matrix of nature and the spiritual forces that work through nature because what flower essences are about is making that connection and so it's not just a little bottle you take off the shelf but it's a whole way of life mm -hmm. Because I wanted to ask you um, what you understand by what Steiner called the elemental beings. I mean, yes. that can all sound yeah. a bit uh, wacky, even. Uh, yeah, of course it does. But for me, it's not, um, it's something quite real, quite real, um, to become aware that it's not all just a material world out there, any more than our bodies are only material. There's a soul in nature. And for me, that's perhaps a better word than saying elemental, because then we get these pictures of some little fairies or some little... But what I think we have to do first is move into the imagination, the higher imagination, that the earth is a living being. Mm -hmm. And then when we do that, we, for instance, we feel the air moving through us. In a moment like now, the breeze just came through. Well, the air is alive. 
there are all kinds of forces, if you want to say qualities of beingness, that come in the air. And the same with the water, if we look out on that pond. It all is alive, and in that sense, it's richly textured. And that, to me, is the, the key. And this is what Rudolf Steiner taught, is that the elemental world, it really is a reflection of our own souls. And to the degree that our soul moves into a, a kind of communion or an embrace with something besides just the hard material, we begin to see and taste and sense this other world. It, it doesn't have to be at all mystical. So let me give you a quick example, because I, I do a lot of the gardening here. And I'll be working, say, for instance, with the roses. And roses like a lot of rich substance underneath of them. And I'll just get that sense, I need to nourish. I need to bring more compost and dig it into these roses. And then I come back and I see that that rose has more red than it used to. So it's, it is a kind of language one develops. I, I really don't think we need to have it be anything that foreign or mystical. We need to just take the steps as any human being would. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the big step in having that relationship is we no longer see nature as this warehouse of materials that we're just taking from. And all these ecological problems we have that we're trying to figure out how to deal with, mm -hmm. they would all change if we had the relationship with nature as the beingness that we're relating as another being, mm -hmm. not just as material objects that we take. Yeah. And one last thing, then to come into this idea of what was called the elemental world is really to come into the idea of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, which is very central also to the Native American mythology of this, of this place. If you look at any, at the Hopi, at all of the great Native American tribes, they all had this recognition of the four elements in their mantras, in their, in their chants, in their prayers, in their blessings. And very different than the elemental table. The four elements is really to understand that earth, air, fire, and water are alive and bless us all the time. And that also connects again to Dr. Bach because that's how the remedies are made. We go into the place where the flower is, is blooming. We allow the air to waft through. We set it on the ground where the flower is blooming. We allow the warmth of the sun. Um, the substance of the plant, all of that, the water is collected from a nearby stream it be, so that it has captured from that plant something breathing into it from the four elementals. And if we can get that, we're a well on our way. We don't need to have a lot of fancy esoteric language for it. Mm -hmm.